So external structures of our bird friends. Body is covered with skin and its derivatives. So your beak, your claws, and your feathers. Um, same as with other species, you have your um, lower mandible, but now you have an upper mandible as well. Your crown, nostril, nape, wrist, oracle feathers, crop area, vent, claw, and abdomen. So moving on to skin apparently. Epidermis is thin, flat epithelial cells that produce keratin. Dermis is thicker, tough, fibrous connective tissue, a good storage for fat, and smooth muscles innervate the feather follicles, which helps with heat regulation. They do not have sweat glands. They do have the uropygeal gland, which is the preen gland. So it's on the dorsal surface at the upper base of the tail. It gives off like an oily, fatty secretion that helps to oil and waterproof the feathers. It varies in size and species, and some species don't have them. The beak is a derivative of the skin. Upper and lower mandible are covered with a horny keratin layer, which grows continuously. So sometimes you do have to trim beaks. Vary in hardness and flexibility depending on the function of the beak. The claws are the ends of each toe. Horny sheaths derived from specialized scales. Again, they grow continuously and it's gonna differ in the type of species. So if they're perchers, they're gonna have one type of claw. If they're um, hunters, they're gonna have another type of claw. Feathers are outgrowths of skin made out of protein, and they do have sensations, but only at the base. Functions, obviously flight, protection, thermoregulation, camouflage in some cases, and even communication behaviors. The contour feathers are the most visible and give the bird the shape. They have the most compact microstructure so you have your inferior umbilicus, your superior umbilicus, your calamus or your quill, ranches, veins, barbs, barbules, and hamuli. So there's your different types of feathers. Feathers do not originate from the entire body. They overlap each other and there are apteria areas, which are just bare skin. External parasites chew and consume on parts of the feather veins, which creates weak points. And there's also gonna be damage from just daily wear and tear that happens. The fault bar is the stress bar, which is the weakened area on the feather vein where barbs lack the barbules. The feather is stressed during its growth when blood flow is interrupted. And the most common stressor is the poor diet. Molting is the process of the feather replacement. I'm sure we've all seen this happen. It occurs in a species specific pattern, which allows the bird to continue with normal activities. Usually replacement is symmetrical. So one or two pairs of flight feathers are molted at a time and usually there's an annual molt. So the feathers are gonna develop from the papillae and the feather tracts of the dermis. The cells are activated by physiological and environmental factors. The increasing day length stimulates pituitary and thyroid glands to produce hormones that stimulate molting. So when would they molt? Spring, summer, yeah, as the days are getting longer. Oh, Increasing day length. So a growing feather is equal to a blood feather. Has anyone ever had to deal with a blood feather? Yes. 
Am I the only one that it scares the crap out of? It's terrifying. It is. <laughs> so the newly developed feather pushes the old feather out and the feather emerges covered in periderm. The periderm gets removed by preening. The blood vessels from the dermis reach into the new feather. When the feather is fully grown, the blood dries up and the rachis are pinched closed. However, if the preening gets out of control or you have a stupid owner, they will pluck it right out or pluck part of it. And then it just keeps bleeding. And it's very scary because you have to go in and pluck out the last part of it. The bird screams bloody murder. It's a terrifying thing to have to do, but it's the only way to stop the bleeding. If you leave that quill in there, it's just gonna continue to bleed. You can't stop it. So it's a very scary process. I'm not a big fan of birds anyway. So when they scream at me like that, I tend to get a little jumpy. All right, so musculoskeletal system. So obviously we know that the skeletons of birds are highly specialized to support both being able to walk and to fly. Modifications allow for flight and walking. They have a reduction in the number of bones as well as fusion of some of the bones so that they have plates instead of individual bones which is gonna make them a little lighter. Reduction in bone density and loss of the internal bone matrix. So the bones are hollow and filled with air spaces which make them lighter than a normal skeleton. The axial skeleton, the bones provide a general framework of the body. Excuse me. You have the skull, the vertebral column, and the sternum. And then the appendicular skeleton is the bone supporting movement, locomotion. So wings, shoulders, legs, pelvic bones, those are all gonna help the bird to move. The skull is thinner than other animals. The jaw extends into that keratinized bill. You have large, in this particular picture, really creepy looking eye sockets bordered by the um, sclerotic ring. And a small portion of the skull is devoted to the smell system. The vertebral column is your cervical vertebrae, um, greater than in a mammal, because birds have greater neck flexibility. If you've ever seen an owl turn its head all the way around, it's real creepy. Freaks you out the first time you see it, even if you know it's coming. Thoracic vertebrae are rigid and provide a strong support for the rib cage. The eucinate process overlaps adjoining rear ribs. Lumbar and sacral vertebrae are fused to form a bony plate to support the legs. It's called the sync sacrum. Coccygeal vertebrae the first few are mobile so that they can move their tail feathers. And then the paga style is fused bony structures that support the tail feathers. So they can only move those first couple of vertebrae. After that, it's just a bony plate. The sternum itself, I'm sure we've all seen, large and concave. Just like everybody else, it protects the chest and it acts as a place or origin of the flight muscles, so the keel. The pectoral or shoulder girdle is three pairs of bones, the coracoids, the clavicles, and the scapulas. The wing attaches to the joint in the glenoid cat cavity. Wings are a joint at the shoulder that allows for rotation in several planes and the wing muscles attach at the pectoral crest of the humerus. So the humerus is going to be longer in birds relative to like a mammal because they need that soaring. 
So a bird's wingspan in relation to their body is going to be much bigger than our arm span. Unless you're like an NBA player and they have those really weird long arms. The joint at the elbow allows movement only parallel to the wing. And then they have a patagium, which is a web of skin that extends from the shoulder to the wrist and helps with aerodynamic, aerodynamics and helps them to soar. The alula bone originates from the wrist and it carries the steering feathers. The metacarpal bones join with fingers to help support primary flight fingers. Feathers, flight fingers, and nobody even reacted. Flight fingers, really guys? Okay. So the pelvic girdle provides a rigid framework of support for the legs. You have three paired bones joining in where the leg attaches the body. The ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. This should all sound familiar to you guys. The distal ends are not fused, which provides room to facilitate egg laying. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. The femur attaches to the pelvis at the hip joint, and it's directed forward at the knee. This gives greater and lesser trochanters at site of muscle attachment. The tibiotarsis and the fibula and the tarsometatarsis are a single bone of the ankle, which is the hock for the bird. Is it just me or are those feet like crazy scary? No. So the feet, you have a metatarsal pad. The bottom of the foot is surrounded by two, three, or four toes. Apparently they get to pick. Or no. So one toe faces to the rear and three face forward. That's going to be an ansodactyl. A zygodactyl is going to be the second and the third toes face forward and the first and fourth toes face backwards. So again, it's just going to depend on if they're a percher, if they're a hunter, how are their feet going to best serve them. So classification of muscles in birds, many of them are going to be placed ventrally near the center of gravity, which makes sense. Skeletal muscles have white or red muscle fibers or a combination of both. So your white fibers are thick, low blood supply, little myoglobin, uses stores of glycogen. They're in the flight muscles and short distance flyers. Red fibers are thin have a good blood supply, fat, myoglobin, and mitochondria. And these are in the flight muscles of long distance flyers. Okay, does that make sense? That you would need the red muscle fibers for the longer flyers because they're gonna need more energy. <clears throat> so pairs of the wing muscles are responsible for a specific action raising or depressing the leading edge of the wing, pectoral muscles, and super... I literally never learned how to say this word, and I called it the superfragilistic ecphialidocious muscle just because it's such a crazy word forever. So I apologize, I'm probably going to screw it up. Supracoracoidus muscle. Pulling the wing forward or backwards, extending or flexing the wing, and controlling movements of that alula bone. Leg muscles, again, are going to be close to the center of gravity, primarily located over the femur. Why would that be? Or take off. It's, oh, okay. So they can push off, yeah. It's going to absorb the impact when they land, and it's also going to give them that extra push when they take off. Um, it also controls the movements of the toes through long tendons, so that's what gives them that perching reflex.
So the muscles of the head and neck, the extent of the jaw muscles are gonna obviously vary depending on diet, just like with mammals. What they eat is gonna determine how strong the jaw is. Neck muscles allow movement in different creepy directions. The hatching muscle is used to help the chick break its shell open. So then once it breaks through, that muscle is gonna start to atrophy. So in proportion to the body size, the birds actually have a very large brain, which is why I'm not really sure where the term bird brain came from. So this is where the control centers are that are very similar to mammals. You have your um, relatively large vision and hearing and small for taste, touch, and smell. The vision is obviously highly developed, a large part of the skull devoted to housing and protecting the eyes. The shape of the eyes is dependent on the orbits. So if the bird is awake during the day, they have round or relatively flat eyes. The nocturnal species are gonna have tubular eyes, which is going to help them to see in the dark and catch the little tiny mouse that's running across the field. So, anatomy of the eye, you have the fibrous tunic, which is the sclera and the cornea. The scleric, sclerotic ring, which is gonna reinforce the sclera. And the mitigating membrane is the third eyelid, just like Nicotating. I don't know why I put a G in there. Sorry. The uveal tunic is the carotid iris and ciliary muscles, and the muscles in the iris are actually under voluntary control. Are the muscles in your iris under voluntary control? It's an involuntary response. In birds, they can actually control it though. So they can control how dilated they become. The neural tunic is the retina. Vascular pectin distributes nutrition to the eye. So the pectin are those little I don't even know how to describe them. Those little things right there. So rods and cones are very similar to mammals. However, if it's a nocturnal animal, it makes sense that it's gonna have more rods than cones, right? Why? Because they'll see better in the dark. Right. They have a high level of visual acuity. Um, there's a reduced number of blood vessels in the actual retina. Numerous photoreceptor cells in the retina. Each cone has a connection to a nerve fiber. And some species have a second temporal fovea. An oil droplet in each cone increases color reception. And there is a wide spectrum of light wavelengths that are perceived. Living out in the country, I am always amazed because we could have a field mouse that is the same color as the soybean plants running through the field and we will have something swoop down and scoop it up from like, I don't know, higher than my house. So that's always amazing to me that they can pick that out and just swoop down and catch it mid run. So the ears are located on the sides of the head, behind and slightly below the eyes. They have the external ear, which is separated from the middle ear by the eardrum. Middle ear, which is a single bone, which is the columella, and the inner ear, which is just a labyrinth of membranes and the cochlea.
So you can see apparently pre and post mortem, um, the asymmetrical ear openings. So the oper operculum, asymmetrical ear openings, large eardrums, columnae and cochlear, well-developed acu acoustic center in the hind brain, and a very large number of auditory neurons. I always love, like we never had owls before, we just got them, so I love sitting outside at night and listening to them, and then something like will just rustle like a leaf and they just take off. Like it's the smallest noise and they will just take off and fly away. To be fair, we also live on a highway, so they probably figure if they hear a noise, it might be something coming to get them. Poor sense of taste. Very few taste buds scattered on the sides of the tongue and the soft palate. Um, sensitivities and thresholds are species specific though. So whether they can taste the bitter, salty, sour, um, and the sense of smell is highly variable, variable among species. Some of them use it to find food, others don't. So touch, the nerve endings in the Andrews corpsicle are prevalent on the tongue, palates, and bills. The Herbst corpsicle are nerve endings present on the cloaca, legs, wings, uropygeal gland, and feather bases. So the endocrine system has seven major glands plus the pancreas that has an endocrine component. So it's gonna function similar to the glands of the mammals. So birds have a very fast metabolism because imagine trying to eat a huge meal and then take off. probably not gonna work out very well for you. So they have a high demand for energy and they have learned to assimilate from the food that they consume. They also eat very frequently, don't they? Yeah. That's what I thought. And they poop a lot too. Yes, poop all the time. Yeah. Usually on my car right after I've washed it. So the beaks are going to vary depending on the diet and the foraging habits. So seed eaters are going to have that thick crushing beak. Woodpeckers have a heavy blunt beak. Raptors have the sharp edged hook beak and shorebirds have that long delicate beak. <coughs> The mouth, you have the hard upper palate, soft lower palate, tongue, salivary glands, and taste buds. So the soft palate may be enlarged into a pouch for temporary food storage, um, especially if it's a scavenger that isn't entirely sure where they're going to get their next meal. The tongue can be highly muscular in some species but it has very few muscles usually, and it's moved by the muscles of the jaw instead of the actual muscles of the tongue. So the esophagus is a little different. You have the crop, which is an expansion over the inner clavicle space. So this is where um, storage, lubrication, and the passage of food is all regulated. Very little digestion actually occurs in the crop. Pigeons and doves at, beating, at breeding time have a mucosal lining that can break down and form pigeon milk, and insect-eating birds have heavy epithelium that protects it from swallowing the insects alive. For the stomach, you actually have two separated compartments. The proventriculus, which is the glandular stomach, this is where chemical digestion is going to start. So you have your pepsin and your hydrochloric acid. And then the gizzard is the muscular stomach, which has striated muscles to grind up the food. And the ingested grit aids in grinding food. 
and the undigested <laughs> food is ground into a pellet by some species. Can somebody give me an example of who has a pellet? Come on guys, nobody went to a nature center as a kid? Oh, owls. Yeah, owls have pellets. It's really gross. Kind of cool. It's kind of cool, but it's also really <laughs> gross. You gotta be honest. We used to dissect those all the time. So. Yeah, when I was in school, we dissected yeah. them. Really? Yeah. Oh. It was really fun. So it was kind of cool. Interesting. Kind of gross, kind of cool. Yeah, which is, I mean, basically like 90% of our jobs. Yeah. Kind of gross, kind of cool. Yeah. Um, the pellets are regurgitated though. They're not um, defecated, just so you guys know. The liver is bilobed and the right lobe is larger than the left. The pancreas itself is relatively large, um, especially if they eat fish and grain. It rests in the loop of the duodenum and the endocrine portion occupies more tissue mass than in a mammal. So why would the pancreas be relatively large, especially in fish and grain eaters? To accommodate the fat. More of the sugar. Okay. Because the pancreas produces what? Insulin. Right, so if they're eating a lot of grains, they're gonna produce a lot of sugar. They need the insulin to counterbalance it. The duodenum is the main organ for digestion and absorption of nutrients. So it's gonna vary in length and thickness depending on diet. The cecca are paired sacs at the junction of the small and large intestines in some species. They play a role in water absorption and in bacterial fermentation of cellulose. So kind of like ruminants where they have their own special digestive system. And contents are um, excreted independent of the fecal material. Large intestine is where most of the reabsorption of water and minerals happens. The cloaca is at the end of the digestive tract and it has three sections, the coprodium, the uro urodium, and the protodium. So one receives excrement from the intestine, one receives discharge from the kidneys and the genital ducts, and one stores excrement and then gets rid of it on my car. The vent is the muscular anus, which expels waste products called mute. So the heart is four chambered, just like ours. Right side smaller and less muscular, <clears throat> sounds familiar, lies in the cranial portion of the thoracoabdominal space. So the blood vessels are gonna be specialized to meet specific demands of the avian body. So there's gonna be large pectoral and brachial arteries to help them with flight. They're also gonna have um, the renal portal system. And they're going to exchange heat in the lower extremities through the arteries and veins that are placed close together. So this is gonna be kind of like what happens going into the scrotum. One's gonna heat up the other one to maintain the temperature. So there's high demands on the circulatory system so that they can maintain that relatively fast metabolism. So birds' heart rates are crazy. Mm -hmm. What's a normal heart rate for a bird? You can't get low 20. You can. Usually people give up and just go, yeah, it's really fast. Um, and it's going to cause more rapid blood flow through the body, which is going to help to metabolize all of the waste. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. I have never seen an electrocardiogram done on a bird. 
Has anybody else ever seen them? I'm gonna have to call Dr. Briggs and ask him if he does them. Um, so the electrodes would be placed on the wings and the legs to detect any electrical voltage changes as the heart chambers contract and relax. So apparently this is an important tool to monitor patients, but again, I've never seen it done. So the blood's going to carry nutrients, oxygen, and hormones to the cell, carry metabolic waste to the lungs and kidneys, and control and prevent disease and regulate body temperature. So blood's a little different in an avian. You have your red blood cells, which are going to look a little bit different, as you can see, and then you have your leukocytes, which are heterophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. And then you have your thrombocytes. So first of all, what's the difference with the um, red blood cells? Can I have a nucleus? Mm -hmm. And then here is a picture of a heterophil, your thrombocyte, eosinophil, just to give you an idea. So your red blood cells are oval, nucleated, and larger than those of a mammal. If somebody hands you a slide of avian blood, you should be able to know right away that that's what it is. It is very easy to recognize. The red blood cells are formed in the bone marrow of adult birds or in the spleen and liver, depending on the species. They possess hemoglobin, so what color are they? Red. Mm -hmm. And the total number of cells are dependent on age, sex, diet, and time of year. So the heterophils are phagocytes. They are equivalent to a neutrophil. Um, they're round with rod-shaped red-orange granules. So this picture doesn't really do it justice. Um, and then they have a nucleus that has clumped chromatin. So what would that look like? Nobody? Okay, let's see if it covers it up here. Rhombocytes are nucleated cells that act as platelets. They're smaller than the red blood cells with large round oval nucleus, and they are produced in the bone marrow. The plasma is 80% water and 20% dissolved substances, such as salt, glucose, fats, amino acids, hormones, antibodies, vitamins, enzymes, waste products, and special blood proteins. That should sound quite familiar to you guys, right? Okay, so the respiratory system must act quickly and efficiently because of the fast metabolism and the high energy level. So, the oral cavity has several structures that are used in respiration, the glottis, the coenae, and the larynx. So the trachea is gonna be long. It's going to moisturize the inhaled air, which is gonna help to aid in the production of sound. And sometimes it's coiled in some of the species. The cernix is the voice box, which is an enlargement, enlargement of the trachea right above the sternum. It has muscles, air sacs, and vibrating membranes. So the vocalization complexity depends on the number of muscles present in the cernix. The trachea bifurcates into two bronchi. Again, should sound familiar. The bronchi further dissolve 
further divide into the mesobronchi in the lung, secondary bronchi or ventrobronchi, parabronchi, and then the air capillaries, which is where the gas is exchanged um, with the blood capillaries. Air sacs are nine thin-walled, highly vascularized membranes. So they're going to have air reservoirs. It's gonna to help to warm and moisturize the air, help with thermal regulation, and help to make the birds more buoyant. The lungs are very small and inelastic, but they are highly vascularized, so they're going to be bright red, and they're attached to the thoracic vertebrae and ribs. So, in order to get the air to flow through the entire respiratory system, they actually have to do two inspirations and two expirations. And they do not have a diaphragm to help with the breathing process. And the lungs are inelastic. So, what's doing most of the breathing for them? So respiratory rate, again, varies with species, activity level, age, sex, time of day, and outdoor temperature. Um, so it's very difficult to use respiratory rate as a diagnostic tool. I will be honest with you, the only birds I've ever seen have been in some sort of distress. So I've never even tried to get a respiratory count on them because they're always upset by the time I see them. Smaller birds breathe faster than larger birds, and birds in flight have a higher rate than non-flying birds. So the thermal regulation, you have heat conservation with the countercurrent heat exchange program, change in posture, shivering, and um, short-term nocturnal torpor. The cooling takes place when the air in the lungs picks up heat from tissues in the blood. Um, methods for increased amounts of cooling would be increasing the breathing rate, which would be panting, um, reducing activity during the warmest part of the day, bathing, adjusting the position of the body feathers, or defecating on their legs for evaporative cooling. Ooh, that sounds fun. Anybody want to try that this summer? <laughs> So the urogenital system encompasses both urinary and reproductive systems. The kidneys are located dorsally in a slight depression formed at the level of the syncecrum. It's elongated with three divisions and the divisions subdivide into lobules containing the nephrons. Each nephron consists of one glom glomerular, glom why can I not talk today? Glomerulus, which is the filter and the tubule. And you have two types of tubules, the loops of Henle and the unlooped. The ureters are extensions of the main collecting ducts surrounded by smooth muscle. It's gonna squeeze the urates from the kidney or inhibit their flow into the cloaca. Urine passes through the ureters into the uroduum, which is moved upward to the colon and cecum, or propelled outward through the vent. So urine is mostly nitrogenous waste um, component uric acid. It's eliminated from the body as a paste, which again is called the mute. So it's excreted in combination with the fecal material, and it's characterized by a dark fecal center surrounded by a ring of the white urates. So now you guys know exactly what you're cleaning off of your car when the bird poops on your car. Makes it a little grosser, doesn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> so the reproductive system is highly specialized and unique. Reproductive organs on the left side are larger and reproduction is periodic and under hormonal control. So the gonads are relatively small during non-breeding season. In the males, anatomy and function is similar to those in mammals. 
the birds produce the spermatozoa genetically ready to penetrate a developing ovum. Copulation, the sperm is transferred into the female's vagina. The grooved erectile penis attaches to the wall of the cloaca. Sperm transfer occurs when the cloaca of the male and the female are in close proximity. Doesn't that sound romantic? <laughs> the right female ovary is rudimentary. Ova are produced from follicles in the cortex of the ovary. And again, the FSH and LH hormones are involved. So ovulation is the process where the ovum follicle leaves and enters the oviduct. There's five sections of the oviduct. The infundibulum, which does what? We just talked about this in the last, in the last PowerPoint. That's where the ovum gets caught, coming out of the ovary. The magnum, isthmus, uterus, which is the shell gland, and then the vagina. So the number of eggs that the female lays and incubates varies among species. Some lay one egg per day, some lay eggs every other day, some lay eggs at four to five day intervals. And then you have two types of egg layers, the determinate layer and the indeterminate layers. So eggs must be kept warm and humidified. Average temperature for many species is 35 degrees Celsius. And the amount of time for the eggs to hatch varies by species. Prolactin promotes broodiness and hormones stimulate development in the brood patch. So hatching involves powerful neck muscles and specialized egg tooth on the chick's bill. <clears throat> After the hatching, we already talked about how that neck muscle will start to atrophy and the egg tooth disappears, which is really sad because it's kind of cute. It is. I don't know why. It's super sharp though. Yeah, it is, but it's so, I don't know. I think it's kind of cute. So determining the sex of chicks. Sex is determined by genetic info passed on by the female. So they can lay two types of eggs, the ZW and the ZZ. Only when the female contributes the W chromosome is there a male. So Z is the dominant female chromosome. W is the recessive male chromosome. And then sperm all have the W. So, everybody starts off with one W from the sperm. Then the female is either going to give a Z or a W and determine what we're getting. Newly hatched chicks are gonna be different depending on their species and the degree of um, mobility. And there we go. I did not make it through all of those. Get that.